It is no state secret that President Xi Jinping, during his five years as China's most senior leader, not only has strengthened the party's role in the governance of China, but also he has extended the party's reach into global governance. What is it about the party, the Communist Party of China, the CPC, and its governing philosophy that makes Xi so committed to enhancing the party's power? What are the party's vision and challenges, positions and policies? How does the CPC, as China's perpetually ruling party, claim legitimacy? What innovations has she brought to the party's leadership role? And regarding its new role in global governance, what is it about the CPC that gives it standing to organize diverse political parties worldwide to work together, in Xi's phrase, for a community with a shared future for all humanity? Will other political parties accept the de facto leadership of a communist party that eschews multi-party elections? Under Xi's core leadership, how might the party's role in governing China and in engaging the world develop over the next five or ten years? Understanding the new CPC takes us closer to China. Serving the people has long been an explicit goal of the Communist Party of China, and the CPC has been focusing on making people's lives better. Since President Xi Jinping took office at the end of 2012, the Politburo, China's decision-making body, has introduced various policies to enhance the CPC's close ties with the people, including an eight-point code to cut bureaucracy. The measures include fewer traffic controls for leaders' security for their trips, less ribbon-cutting or cornerstone-laying ceremonies, fewer officials' visits abroad, eliminate lavish government spending, and the alike. In parallel, more resources are being allocated for improving people's quality of life. In 2006, China abolished the agricultural tax, which is costing farmers more than 130 billion yuan every year. By 2008, tuitions and fees in primary and junior high schools were canceled. And in China's 12th five-year plan, the number of basic need housing units built and houses in rundown areas rebuilt is 36 million. Compare the political parties in foreign countries with the CPC in terms of how they rule their countries. Obviously, the CPC is the ruling party on a perpetual basis, whereas in Western countries they shift based on elections. But in both cases, there is a process of ruling. So, what's the difference between the roles the CPC and foreign political parties play in their own countries? How does the CPC's ruling philosophy compare with that of foreign political parties? The, the fundamental thing is that political parties are the instrument through which the a country is governed and the CPC has to do that and in fact the CPC is really rather sensitive to shifts in uh, public opinion and so on so I don't think it fundamentally differs in character from political parties in, in other countries so I think it's perfectly easy to have a dialogue between the CPC and other parties and as there were well over 200 parties came to the CPC's recent conference on the dialogue between the CPC and other political parties. So the proof of the pudding is in the eating, as you say, in English. The other parties in the world won't have a dialogue with the CPC. If they didn't want to have a dialogue, they wouldn't have come. But over 200 came from 120 countries, so they want to discuss. The CPC was put in power in 1949 by the Chinese people. If it made very big mistakes, I'm sure the Chinese people would remove it from power. So far, it hasn't. And also, there are threats which the CPC itself recognizes. For example, President Xi Jinping has said that corruption is a deadly threat to the CPC. So it has constantly to correct itself. Uh, to be frankly, I think the Communist Party of China uh, should be translated into Chinese Gongshandang, uh, not as a party, because a party, both in Chinese and uh, uh, Latin, uh, originally, it means part, not a public. Uh, for the uh, Chinese Communist Party, is not for private, for a part, it's for public interests of the whole Chinese nations, which uh, the West cannot understand all this, uh, the meaning of that. Uh, so uh, the Communist Party leadership uh, is written uh, in the Chinese constitution. So uh, that's different with any other parties in other countries, uh, that the party is just not uh, permanent on the power, it's just running for the power and uh, uh, temporarily uh, on the power. So. Uh, which make many people confused about the Communist Party of China. So 
but uh, some people even suggest we should change the translation, like the uh, Kuomintang. Uh, originally, they translated the Chinese Nationalist Party. Now, in you know, KMT, Kuomintang. In theory, the CPC represents the interests of the general public in China, whereas foreign political parties stand for the interests of part of their people. With such a fundamental difference, could they truly work together in building a community with a shared future for humanity? Well, again, I don't quite agree with the way it's put. Other politi all, all political parties that I know of in other countries primarily claim to represent the um, uh, in the interests of the whole people. Now, even in China, there is uh, differentiations within the situation. If officially, when the CPC took power, it was constituted by a block of four classes. Um, and it represented also the whole of the Chinese people, but m most political parties claim to represent the whole, of, the whole of the people. Now, whether they do is quite a different question. In my opinion, m most of them don't, but that's what they, that, that is what they claim to do. The Chinese part, if you look at the founding philosophy of the Chinese Communist Party, it claims to be two things simultaneously. It claims to be a party of which the working class is the leading class in China, and it claims to be the party of the whole of the Chinese people, leading the Chinese nation towards rejuvenation. That's what it is. That's why it's in power. I mean, in 1949, the Chinese Communist Party did not come to power saying we are going to introduce a Western-style political system. So therefore, the, the criticism of the CPC that it doesn't have a Western-style political system is really a rather stupid criticism. How can communications among political parties influence world politics? Well, I think they influence it in the way in which I outlined previously. That is, government, many of the parties there were very important. I mean, there was large numbers of... Um, uh, prime ministers, for, former prime ministers, speakers of parliament, um, and very influential political leaders there. They all, they're either in government, or, or if they're not in government today, they may be in government, or even if they're not immediately going to be in government, they have a major influence on the public opinion in their country. So China obviously wants to reach out to the widest possible range of opinion in order, to, firstly, to know what it's thinking, it's a dialogue. It's not called China will lecture to the world's political parties. It was called a dialogue. And a lot of people expressed their views quite firmly at the meeting. So firstly, China ne itself needs to, the CPC needs to learn from what are these different opinions which exist in other countries. And secondly, it needs to be able to explain its positions to a number of other parties in other countries because there can be misunderstandings. I mean, there's two different things which can exist in, the, in politics, right? One is there can be real differences of interest, which you have to deal with. But the second is there can be simply misunderstandings. And the two can get in way of each other because a problem which could be solved may t not be solved if both sides misunderstand what, what is going on. So therefore, the question of clarity and explaining what is the positions of people and everybody understands it is extremely important. We just a starting point. Of course, we cannot uh, rely on that one uh, dialogue that can uh, uh, finally solve the different uh, understanding of the community of shared future. But this is very important. Uh, it's uh, just after the end of the 19th Party Congress. Uh, so the many, many countries want to know what's the meaning of the new era of the Chinese socialism with uh, characteristics and what's the uh, signal sent to the, uh, the community of the, bell, uh, of the shared future. So I think that this dialogue uh, many folks on that. The people's desire for a good life is the goal that our party strives towards. So our development is for the people, and the fruits of development which rely on the people are shared by the people. This is what I want to tell friends. The leading position and the governing position of the CPC is the choice of history, the choice of the Chinese people. I think in the past three decades or more, China's democratic process has moved very fast. This process would have been unimaginable for many Chinese people in the past. What specifically is the definition of philosophically uh, advanced? Uh, what are the characteristics? How do you define it? How do you, what, what are the determinations for philosophical advancement? 
This is the unity of belief and action. This is the advanced nature. To make a simple analogy, the party's advanced nature means it is always at the forefront of the times. As an individual, one must also be at the front and be going in the right direction. Ideology must also be advanced. Actions must also be advanced. That means doing everything better than others. Advanced nature is by comparison. It means doing better than people in general. For instance, in times of war, you must be among the first to charge, the last to retreat. In peacetime, you must be among the first to endure hardship and the last to receive. You must contribute more to the collective interest, the party's interest, and the people's interest, giving less importance to one's own affairs. Generally speaking, advanced nature means standing in the front. That is what I would call advanced nature. We are now fighting corruption. This is fundamentally targeted at checking corrupt party members so as to maintain the advanced nature and purity of the party and its members to make it always at an advanced level. Only then can we win the people's trust. Without the people's trust, any party will fall. We are no exception. What are some of the fundamental beliefs or processes that you would call fundamental to understand? Uh, before the founding of the People's Republic of China, the CPC had already been in power in parts of the revolutionary base. Since the establishment of the PRC in 1949, the party has ruled the whole nation for more than 60 years. Over many years of practice in government, the CPC gradually formed its governing philosophy. Our party's fundamental goal is to serve the people heart and soul. Our party comes from the people, is rooted in the people, and serves the people. The people's desire for a good life is the goal that our party strives towards. So our development is for the people, and the fruits of development, which rely on the people, are shared by the people. The period of the Chinese People's War against Japanese aggression witnessed the great growth of the CPC. Before the war, the CPC had barely more than 40,000 members. After the war, the number of CPC members mushroomed to reach 1.2 million. The CPC had also developed an army of 1.2 million and governed a population of 100 million. The governing position of our party in China is history's choice and the people's choice. When the war of resistance was over, the CPC had about 1.2 million troops, while Chiang Kai-shek was said to have 8 million troops. We wanted a coalition. We wanted peace, not war. But Chiang Kai-shek refused. He invaded the liberated areas and wanted to eliminate the CPC. At the time, he was holding talks with us on the surface, but in fact was preparing to eliminate the CPC. We were forced into a war of self-defense. What happened after the War of Liberation? 1.2 million people defeated 8 million. What was the force behind this? Why did the CPC's troops increase the more they fought? They should have decreased in the fighting. But we had the people's support. Wives sent their husbands to the battlefield and parents sent sons to the front. These are true stories from history. So our army grew with each battle and became stronger with each battle. This is what I want to tell friends. The leading position and the governing position of the CPC is the choice of history the choice of the Chinese people. As another example, the CBC also needs to meet the people's demand for livelihood. In those years, the peasants were the bulk of China's population. Farmers cared most about the issue of land. Most of the land in China was owned by landlord. Many farmers did not own land and could only make a poor living by working for the landlords. The CPC met the farmers' demands by confiscating the land of landlords and then distributed it among poor farmers. Land, its ownership and use, has always been a major issue in China's history. Before the CPC emerged, farmers were required to pay substantial fees to the owners of the land, their landlord. In late 1920s, CPC started the land revolution in its several bases. Jinggangshan in Jiangxi province was one of them. 
It confiscated land from the landlord class and distributed evenly among farmers. This policy improved the quality of life of many peasants. One can only imagine that the mass of farmers sided with the party like CPC and supported the CPC. Their offspring joined the army led by the party, which defeated the army of the then ruling Kuomintang. Moreover, the CPC practiced a high degree of democracy in those years. Some of the CPC's local governments were elected democratically. It's hard to conceive how the elections took place because many Chinese farmers were illiterate and did not know how to write ballot tickets. The CPC invented a very primitive way of voting, casting beans, soybeans. Candidates would sit down and put their hats or bows on the ground. The organizers of the election gave out the ballots, soybeans to the people, one per person. A voter could choose his or her favorite candidate by putting the bean into the bowl or hat behind his or her favorite candidate. Of course, this was primitive and is very rare nowadays. But this method of election is democratic. The elected people are the people's choices. It is said that the party, as the ruling party, on a monopoly basis, has three kinds of challenges. The first is its legitimacy as a perpetual ruling party. Second is transparency, so that the people can exercise some kind of supervision. And third is checks and balances, so that power will not uh, run amok. And, uh, and cause various problems like corruption. I think when it comes to Chinese politics, our understanding of legitimacy to some extent is different from the West. But our general direction is consistent, whether the people are satisfied or not, whether the people approve or not. The people are the main body. I think this direction is consistent. The West has achieved legitimacy through universal suffrage, while the Chinese have used indirect elections to achieve this legitimacy. Of course, China is also a country with an electoral system. We have the People's Congress system. The deputies to the People's Congress and Party Congress deputies are directly elected at and below county level. Only elections above county level are indirect. So our government is also formed by elections. So how, how about the transparency of the decision-making process? How, how important is it that the uh, process of decision-making that you've described is open where all the people can see it? The people's participation is obviously very important. Chinese people participate in many different ways. In particular, the People's Congresses at different levels provide a very effective means of participation. National People's Congress sessions are held once a year. And the Chinese People's Political Consultative Congress is also held once a year. The MPC meetings routinely discuss and approve the government's executive platforms and plans. The Premier first talks about his thoughts, his line of thinking. It is then examined by deputies at the National People's Congress. And then the delegates of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference hold discussions and issue their views. Ordinary people also give their views on the government work report. The day the National People's Congress opens, the government work report is published online. Do you see a developmental process? Uh, in the past, it was said, although the uh, deliberations were there, that the deliberations, both in party congresses and national people's congresses, were more form than substance. It was more rubber stamp for what decisions were already made by a very few leaders. But do you see in recent years more of the deliberation becoming true substance? where the intra-party democracy is becoming real. I think in the past three decades or more, China's democratic process has moved very fast. This process would have been unimaginable for many Chinese people in the past. I would like to give an example of my own experience. I used to be a vice mayor of a city in Zhejiang province.
One of the city's counties was the first to set up a village committee supervision commission system created by a village. The village was a very rich one as a collective economy, but the administration of the village had been problematic. One of the cadres of the village had been jailed for corruption, so the villagers didn't trust the village committee. The villagers believed the committee would squander the village's money. The county leader helped the villagers work out a way to solve their problem. A village affairs supervision commission was elected to oversee the head of the village committee elected by the villagers through universal suffrage. I went to that village several times. The villagers told me they were trying to stop self-administration by villagers turning into self-administration by village officials. After this commission was put in place, many problems that the villagers had worried about disappeared. For example, the director of the village committee would host a meal to receive a guest. The director might only spend 200 yuan, but his own signature is not enough to reimburse that cost. The signature of the supervision commission director is also needed. And after the reimbursement, the accounts need to be published for all the villagers. This was taking place in 2004. How do you look for the development of the party's role in governing China over the next five or ten years? Uh, President Xi has been increasing the role of the party in all aspects of society. So if you had to project forward, uh, what would the party's role look like five or ten years from now? So Well, the party's role in governing the country has been actively strengthened over the years. And the concept of governments actually comes from the West. It's hard to spot such an idea in traditional Chinese culture. So why do we promote social governance? With a market economy, society becomes more and more diversified, with multiple active players. Before 1978, major players in the country included the political party of the CPC, social organizations, and the people. However, with the diversification that comes with a market economy, we have more than the party, social organizations, and the people. In addition, we have enterprises and citizens who are all part of the diversified pool of players. As a result, there naturally arises the problem of how to govern such a diverse society. The party documents offer answers. That is, we have to let the general public and the party get involved together in the governance of social affairs. Theoretically, it can be divided into the following three aspects. First, the party and the government take the dominant role in social governance. For issues regarding the direction and principles of China's development, the party and the government should lead and dominate in decision-making. Second, various social organizations should get engaged in social governance in legal and reasonable ways. Third, we should promote a combined way of governing society that coordinates rule of law and rule of virtue. Still more, we have adopted a system of shared governance through consultation. The party, government, society, enterprises and citizens of the country should encourage and promote consultation together to help us strengthen consultative democracy in China even further. Last but not least, to govern modern society, we must have modern capabilities. Otherwise, it's difficult to accomplish the daunting task. Therefore, we promote modernization of the state governance system and governing capabilities. As the largest political party in the world, the Communist Party of China, the CPC, has continuing responsibility for leading the largest population in the world. China's developmental success is counted as the CPC's governing success and developing countries worldwide want to learn how the CPC does it. But what is the CPC model? It cannot be simply a one ruling party system that eschews real multi-party elections because many countries have had similar one-party systems, but they usually devolve into family or oligarchic kleptocracies. What then does the CPC have that other perpetually ruling parties do not have? It is depth of organization, personnel management, internal discipline. All systems of governance have trade-offs. The benefits of a system with a single leading party include implementing critical policies rapidly and assuring that strategies which require long-term commitment have long-term commitment. For example, China's Belt and Road Initiative. The costs or dangers of a system with a single leading party 
is that society is much more dependent on the quality of its leaders and much more vulnerable to their vicissitudes and extremes. There are trade-offs, too, in stricter public regulations. Going forward in the new era, the party faces challenges, economic reform and transformation, social development and transition, while at the same time improving transparency and checks and balances and building institutions that are self-regulating. The party will be judged by the results. That's closer to China.